Thanks for your time tonight. It is good to see you. Good to be here, Liz. Uh, I'd like to get started with something that I think a lot of people are concerned about, and that is the NFL lockout. Um, I know that you have sent a letter, your office has sent a letter, and uh, citing basically the antitrust law that, that New York has, which I wasn't even aware there was one at the state level. But is this real, or is this just a headline-grabbing situation? Because it seems hard to recoup lost tourism dollars that these training camps generate. Well, no, that's, but that's the whole point. If uh, the season doesn't start on time, there's a lot more damage that can be done. Uh, you're, you're right. The New York, we have the Donnelly Act, which is our version of the antitrust laws. And as Attorney General, I can enforce the federal laws and the state law. But the state law uh, has been interpreted differently. There are situations where you can get an injunction under state law when you can under the federal antitrust laws. Hmm. And I'm just gathering documents to be prudent, to uh, make sure I have all the information. So in case there is not a settlement, and we hope the players and the owners are able to settle, uh, I can intervene to represent folks other than the players and the owners who will be severely damaged if the lockout continues. But, there are but you, you mentioned the training you mentioned the training camps. That's that's the tip of the iceberg. Right. Erie County has a contract with the Buffalo Bills that requires us to spend taxpayer money to pay the bills, even right. if the bills don't play. So there, there's a lot to this. There's a lot of economic damage to be done. I think there's a very good argument that the lockout is unlawful because mm -hmm. there's an exception to the rules on lockouts that only applies in collective bargaining situations. And since the union was dissolved, they're not collective bargaining anymore. So I, I think it's very important, while the millionaires are fighting with the billionaires, for someone to watch out for all the regular New Yorkers who could be uh, uh, affected and hurt if the lockout continues. Okay, but, but my understanding, though, is that two of these training camps, and there are three in New York, have already been canceled. And so, arguably, the tourism dollars, the economic development money, has already been lost. So regardless of whether the lockout ends, and we understand that they're hoping to do that by mid-July sometime, uh, the loss will still be there. Will you try to recoup that money for these businesses? And if so, how would that money be distributed? It's, it's, it's way too early to say. I think that it's important to understand that while there are consequences and it, it does hurt to have the SUNY uh, campuses not used for training camp for the Jets and the Giants, they have promised to come back next year. We want to maintain that relationship. Mm. But the consequences of canceling games is far more devastating than that. What happens, uh, think about the bills in Erie County, the concession stands, all the ordinary folks who sell tickets, who uh, sell food, the people who are have businesses that depend on this, and even in other parts of the state, uh, restaurants, bars, they, this is, we, the estimate I think is uh, something like uh, $5 billion in impact economically across the country if this lockout continues. So I'm just looking out for the regular New Yorkers and, and I'm very hopeful that they, they will be able to work this out. There's enough money there for everybody. Um, you know, this would be, as a Jets fan, I feel like this is the year we we're actually going to go to the Super Bowl, so we've got to get the season going. Yeah, you might, as, you might have just lost your re-election bid right there, a Jets fan. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure how people in upstate New York feel about that. But we'll let that one go, though, because I do want to get to something in terms of speaking about the little people and, and, and regular New Yorkers. You know, you, you've also taken on, and really sort of behind the scenes until recently, you're getting some serious play on this one, the mortgage, uh, the massive mortgage scandal, and you're taking on the banks. You've basically subpoenaed and requested information from seven banks. And a recent report in The Nation suggested that you are being asked to maybe let this one go, and it suggested that you could blow up the economy with your inquiry. Who, who's pressuring you on that one? Well, I, I can't discuss uh, the specifics of any particular investigation. We are making an inquiry that has been reported. Uh, this, is, this is something that's a part of an ongoing process. The, uh, look, the economy crashed. Uh, I think it's undisputed it crashed because of the mortgage-backed securities bubble. These were these uh, securities, these investments that people bought that were backed up by pools of mortgages. Now, our particular uh, entry point into this is that almost all of those pools of mortgages were deposited in New York Trust. Right. So New York has particular jurisdictional concern. The only ones that weren't were in Delaware Trust, and I have a cooperation agreement that I've entered into with Bo Biden, the Delaware Attorney General, so that we can have all of the trust together and look into whether there were any irregularities. The market didn't crash because of an earthquake or a flood. It crashed because of human conduct, and I'm determined to do a thorough investigation to see what sort of market abuse took place. Some of it may have been legal, in which case we should have proposed laws or rules to make it illegal. Some of it may have been illegal, but I'm digging in and going to find out, and I have no concern 
uh, that we're going to have a negative impact on the economy. I think until people's confidence is restored that there's one set of rules for everybody and that the markets can work and that Wall Street is not a rigged casino, I think we're going to continue to have problems. So I share that agenda, but I'm not, uh, I'm not going to be satisfied without a thorough investigation okay. to get out all the uh, facts. Attorney General, are, is your goal here to actually bring this to trial? Or is your goal to get a settlement with the banks that subsequently would help people who have been foreclosed on and perhaps lost their homes? I, I, I can't comment on the specifics of the investigation. We're pursuing the investigation. We'll follow the facts. And uh, look, there's, there, there is, uh, there's got to be a restoration of public confidence that there's one set of rules for everybody. I see this problem in the area of, of public integrity. People think there's one set of rules for elected officials and another for others. And this is a big problem for the financial services industry. Look, I was a securities lawyer. I was in a law firm for a long time where we represented big firms, stock exchanges. And I understand this. I, you know, have a lot of friends on the street. This is really the culture that I know well. We've got to regain public confidence that if you get a AAA rated security, that means something. That if you get analysis by uh, in, an independent analyst, it really means something. And that if you buy something, like a mortgage-backed security that people are following the law and following okay. the rules. You know, this foreclosure mess didn't just generate overnight. I mean, as you just suggested, it's been going on for some time. I mean, we've been hearing about it and talking about it forever. You just got in six months ago. This happened actually at least over the last four to five years. And now you're starting to see some former state attorneys general and some current who are still around getting brought to task and asked why, in fact, they didn't prosecute and bring cases. There have n there's not been a single major case in, in the mortgage mess yet. And the person who was sitting there for New York was, was Andrew Cuomo. Do you believe he did enough to address this issue? Oh, yeah. The office, uh, when he was the AG, looked at a variety of, of issues related to the financial crisis. Um, since the crisis in 2008, there have been, there's been a lot uh, there, there have been some inquiries that we're building on. I mean, Senator Carl Levin had a, a terrific bipartisan report that was issued by his committee that, uh, uh, and, and we are in touch with everyone who can share information with us. I'm doing this in as collegial a way as I can. But I am uh, drilling in particularly on this issue related to uh, the New York Trust, related to whether there were people who were foreclosed on that shouldn't have been foreclosed on, whether the chain of title was properly handled. Mm -hmm. and. It, it, there's a, there are a lot of different aspects of this, and there are a lot of different areas of inquiry. I am uh, look partly it's because uh, I have uh, I have very high regard for this industry, and have worked with people there for a long time. The overwhelming majority of people in financial services just want to make money for themselves and their clients, but the bad actors have to be called out. It's my same approach on public integrity. I, I think that we can't ask the public to have confidence in a system if they don't have confidence that it's being properly pleased. I, I understand that you can't talk about an ongoing active investigation, but, but last spring, the former Attorney General Andrew Cuomo issued mortgage-related subpoenas to eight banks. And he was interested in whether or not, and you actually just spoke about this, the banks had somehow misled ratings agencies about what, that these were, in fact, good uh, investments when it turned out that they were actually not. I mean, are you building on that case? He never actually brought a case. Are you, did you pick up where he left off, or is this something entirely new at this point? I know some of it's building, some of it's new. It, it's, I can't really comment on the details, but, but uh, it's, uh, it has been written about, it has been discussed, and it's being discussed on an ongoing basis. What I inherited was something that started at the very end of his tenure, which was an effort to have a resolution with uh, as many as possible of all the 50 state attorneys general and some of the f agencies of the federal government. So that's one framework that uh, we've been dealing with. And, and I hope we can do a full investigation. But again, the goal here is not, not to be punitive, but to make the people who blew up the economy take responsibility and restore public confidence that there's one set of rules for everybody. Okay. Speaking of which, I mean, there have been a number of things that you have focused on. This, the mortgage mess is a big one. Also, hydrofracking. And you've actually subpoenaed recently some of the oil companies. The question is, uh, that you're looking for is to the chemicals and whether or not they have been adequately disclosed in terms of how harmful they would be for the water. And um, I'm curious, you, you actually are also suing over the Delaware Basin drilling. You're suing the federal government. How far are you willing right. to push that? I mean, are you going to push that all well, the way up? I think there, there, there are different aspects of this. I mean, we have subpoenaed uh, 
some of the companies, partly because we're concerned about the, the chemicals, but we're also particularly focused on whether they are adequately disclosing their potential environmental liability. Again, this comes back really to uh, their obligations to investors as well as our obligation to protect the environment. Uh, we have, uh, keep in mind that the, the Department of Environmental Conservation is my client. When the DEC issues its right. regulations and starts that process, I represent them on a day-to-day -day basis. My staff in the Environmental Protection Bureau deals with uh, the commissioner's staff all the time. And uh, I'm hopeful that we'll get a good regulatory framework here in New York. The Delaware River Basin Commission covers an area that goes beyond New York into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Um, and that's a dispute over whether they uh, are a federal agency and as such are, are obliged to follow federal law regarding environmental reviews. We Attorney contend General. they are. They've taken that could, position in the past, and we're holding them to it. Could I just ask, uh, regarding the DEC report, do you, do you agree with the, the characterization by Commissioner Martens that the report is balanced and that drilling can, in fact, be done safely in New York? We're in the middle of this process. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm defending whatever the DEC does. But it's very important for folks to understand, this is a, these are drafts. This is, there's an open comment period. I think a lot of folks got upset and said, oh, my God, this is the end of the process. This is the beginning of the process. So anyone who has concerns about hydrofracking, now is the opportunity to weigh in. And this is a draft, and hopefully we'll get an even better product when we're done. You brought up the issue of public corruption, another focus for you, obviously. You've uh, entered into this unusual arrangement with Comptroller DiNapoli, enabling you to have subpoena power in public corruption cases where you normally wouldn't get it. I'm just curious, have you asked the governor to give you subpoena power in those cases? Because that is something he advocated for when he was AG. No, the, the public integrity focus really was sort of the, the first thing we, we drilled down on when I became AG. We started the Taxpayer Protection Unit for the first time ever. We have a dedicated group of lawyers to go after fraud in government contracts, which is tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer money every year. We expanded our Medicaid fraud unit. We put public integrity officers in every regional office, which is a very major step and is already producing results. And we realized as I were moving around the state doing this that the controller, which is the state's top fiscal watchdog, had a whole army of auditors looking at expenditures of state funds, looking at areas like public authorities, which my office doesn't have jurisdiction over, and that by entering into a joint executive order, we can get the benefit of all of their auditing practices with the, the benefit of our investigative but but uh, the, powers because we can issue subpoenas, we can convene a grand jury, right. we can do a wiretap if it's necessary. So you have a fiscal watchdog and a legal watchdog now working together, uh, avoiding duplication of effort, and it's a great partnership. We're but very the, excited about it. Attorney General, forgive me for interrupting you, but if the governor actually gave you subpoena power in public corruption cases, you wouldn't arguably need to do that. Is that correct? No, they're two different sets of jurisdiction. Now, the governor has referred cases to our office. This is a very unique... Uh, agreement. I'm very proud of it because it's innovative and it's the kind of thing you have to see more of in government. It's enabling us to do more with less, using the resources of the controller's office, combining them. We, there were times when we would be in the same jurisdiction looking at some of the same things and not even know that the other watchdog was there. So this is really something very, very separate. The, 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 the other issues uh, will come up. We've passed a new ethics law. We have a new body that's going to enter the fray. And we'll see how everything goes. But the, the partnership between the controller and the attorney general, and I hope this is something that will continue under future controllers and attorneys general, is just a win-win-win for the people of the state of New York. We're going to be able to police public corruption better, police expenditures of tax dollars, and as, as I've said before, those of us who believe in government as a force for good and believe in the public sector, we have to be the harshest critics as of waste, former, fraud, and abuse in the government. As a former senator, you, and, and obviously this was something that you were criticized about by your opponents when you were during the primary, uh, you said that you would crack down on your ex-colleagues, your legislative colleagues, when and if there was corruption that you had found. Uh, are we going to be seeing any cases coming soon from your office on that? Um, I can't, again, can't comment on ongoing <laughs> investigations. I, I, you, you will be seeing cases in my office. You, we have a very active set of investigations in the broad area of public corruption. And um, uh, putting the public integrity officers in the regional offices, I think, has been a big breakthrough. Uh, a few months ago, I was up in one city upstate, and I announced in a speech I was giving the public integrity officer and identified him. By the time I got back to my hotel that evening, there was a big envelope waiting for me. I don't know how they found out where I was staying, that, <laughs> but uh, it full of documents from a whistleblower who had just been waiting and had my name written on it and the name of the person we had introduced. Huh. So 
uh, uh, trying to report some local corruption because in a lot of parts of the state, people, uh, rightly or wrongly, but they perceive that sometimes local authorities are tied in together and they don't want to report uh, evidence of corruption to a local DA. We are now sending the message that you can come to the, the regional offices of the Attorney General and report anything. We have whistleblower protections if you're reporting an abuse by a government contractor. And uh, it's something that I think is going to yield great benefits for the people of New York State. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time, but I do want to ask you, you know, we're getting a report now, actually, that the Dominic Strauss-Kahn uh, Strauss trial is actually going to be postponed until August. Um, the Manhattan DA, Cy Vance, has been criticized, actually, in some corners by, for bringing this case. I'm just curious, he's been defended by some prosecutors. I wonder where you weigh in. Do you believe he was correct in bringing this case and that he should pursue it? Well, I don't have the evidence the DA had. I don't have, there was forensic evidence, there were witness statements, and frankly, neither do all the other people who seem to be voicing their opinions on this. I don't know, and they don't know. Uh, I do know Cy Vance is a person of tremendous integrity. He and I served on the Sentencing Commission together. Great prosecutor. But I think we should let the DA do his job. And uh, again, I talked about evidence-based practices and getting all the facts. I think you're seeing a lot of opinions where people just don't have access to the information because they can't. Mm. Uh, that the district attorney's got. Let's let him do his job and, and see where we end up. Well, Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, it's great to see you. We uh, unfortunately haven't seen a lot of you over the past six months, but I'm pleased that you sat down with us and hopefully we'll be seeing you again in the future. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thank you, Liz.